Well, welcome viewers. We're in the studio. We're going to do Mark chapter 10. Uh, wow, it's on divorce. So this is going to be full on. Um, this will be very interesting. Why not? I'm going to make it as simple as I can because I'm just a simple person. <laughs> Hopefully um, it's going to be enough for you. But anyway, we'll see what comes out of this. Mark chapter 10. Jesus left that place and went into the region of Judea and across to the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him. His popularity grew quick, didn't it? And as was his custom, he taught them. Some of the Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now there's some cleverness going on here. What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Okay. Now we've got this conflict again about what was in the law and what's real. What, you know, these people were bound by the law. There's no two ways about they were trying to keep the law. They added things to it and added things from it. Um, my Greek teacher explained all this to me and I found it amazing. But it says, it was, a, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote this law. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Um, depending on the reason for the divorce, right? There had to be legitimate reason. Now, um, when you think about it, the structure that they had in the Mosaic law for marriage was pretty stringent. And for someone to ask for a divorce, let's just have a look. I'm going to read this. Um, I found this just on the net. Divorce in the Old Testament. Probably help us a bit. I don't want to try and think I know everything. So, okay. Number one. Subordinate position of woman. Woman among the Hebrews, as amongst most nations of antiquity, occupied a subordinate position. Though the Hebrew wife and mother was treated with more consideration than a sister in other lands, even in other Semitic countries, her position nevertheless was one of inferiority and subjection. Now this isn't uncommon in uh, Christian cults today. The marriage relation, and not just cults, in normal Christianity as well. Um, you get the two groups. You do get women that uh, operate in ministry and then you get Christians that think that shouldn't be happening and blah, blah, blah. The marriage relation from the standpoint of Hebrew legislation was looked upon very largely as a business affair, a mere question of property. A wife, nevertheless, was indeed in most homes in Israel. The husband's most valued possession was the wife. And I can understand that because mine is too. A wife, nevertheless, was indeed in most homes in Israel. The husband's most valued possession or property, a wife, nevertheless. Um, and yet, while... It is true the husband was unconditionally and unreservedly the head of the family in all domestic relations. His rights and per now that doesn't make him right, but that was his position. His rights and prerogatives were manifest on every side. Nowhere is this more evident than in the matter of divorce. According to the laws of Moses, a husband under certain circumstances might divorce his wife. On the other hand, if it at all possible, it was certainly very difficult for a wife to put away her husband. Unfortunately, a double standard of morality in matters pertaining to the sexes is at least as old as Moses. Number two, law of divorce, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. The Old Testament law concerning divorce, apparently quite clear, is recorded most fully in Deuteronomy 24, 1. A pursual of the commentaries will nevertheless convince anyone that there are difficulties of interpretation. The careful reader will notice that the renderings of the King James Version and Revised Version, British and American, differ materially. The King James Version reads in the second part of Deuteronomy 24.1, Then let him write her a bill. The Revised Version has he shall that he shall write while the Hebrew original has neither then nor that, but the simple conjunction and. So there is certainly no command in the words of Moses, but on the other hand, a clear purpose to render the proceeding more difficult in the case of the husband. 
Moses' aim was to regulate and thus to mitigate an evil which he could not ex extirpate. The evident purpose was, as far as possible, to favour the wife and to protect her against an unceremonious expulsion from her home and children. Now, this is interesting because in the narrative, um, my Greek teacher taught me that the men were finding reasons that weren't legitimate but were um, authoritative enough to pass for reason to get a divorce. And um, they were doing this because they were meeting younger women and better women. And um, you can see this today in replacing the older ones for a new one. Number three, marriage, a legal contract. As already suggested, marriage among the Hebrews, as among most Orientals, was more a legal contract than the result of love or affection. It would be, however, a great mistake to assume that deep love was not often present, for at all times the domestic relations of the Hebrew married couple have been compared most favourably with those of other people, ancient or modern. In its last analysis, it was nevertheless a business transaction. The husband or his family had, as a rule, to pay a certain dowry to the parents or guardians of the betrothed before the marriage was consummated. A woman thus acquired could easily be regarded as a piece of property, which, without great difficulty, could be disposed of in case the husband, for any reason, were disposed to rid himself of an un congenial companion and willing to forfeit the moha which he had paid for his wife. The advantage was always with the husband and yet a wife was not utterly helpless for she too, though practically without legal rights, could make herself so intolerably burdensome and hateful in the home that almost any husband would gladly avail himself of his prerogatives and write her a bill of divorce. Thus, though a wife could not divorce her husband, she could force him to divorce her. And we know those proverbs where Solomon said it's better to live on the corner of a housetop than in a home with a contentious wife. Divorce applicable only to wives. The following words of Professor Israel Abrams, Cambridge, England, before the Divorce Commission are to the point. In all such cases where the wife was concerned as the moving party, she could only demand that her husband should divorce her. The divorce was always, from first to last in the Jewish law, the husband's act. The common term used in the Bible for divorce is shilach or ishach, the rendering away of a wife. We never read of sending away a husband. The feminine participle, garusha, the woman thrust out, is the term applied to a divorced woman. The masculine form is not found. Garusha. Number five, process and exceptions. The Mosaic law apparently on the side of the husband made it difficult as possible for him to secure a divorce. No man could unceremoniously or capriciously dismiss his wife without the semblance of a trial in case one became dissatisfied with his wife. Number one, he had to write her a bill of divorcement um, drawn up by some constituted legal authority and in due legal form. In the very nature of the case, such a tribunal would use moral suasion to induce an adjustment and failing in this would see to it that the law in the case whatever it might be, would be upheld. Number two, such a bill or decree must be placed in the hand of the divorced wife. Number three, she must be forced to leave the premises of her former husband. Divorce was denied two classes of husbands. Number one, the man who had falsely accused his wife of antemptual infidelity and two, a person who had seduced a virgin. In addition, a heavy penalty had to be paid to the father of such damsels. It is a prob 
It is probable that a divorced wife who had not contracted a second marriage or had been guilty of adultery might be reunited to her husband, but in the case she had married the second time, she was forever barred from returning to the first husband, even if the second husband had divorced her or died. Such a law would serve as an obstacle to hasty divorces. Divorces from the earliest times were common among the Hebrews. All rabbis agree that a separation, though not desirable, was quite lawful. The only source of dispute among them was to what constituted a valid or reasonable reason or just cause for divorce. Number six, grounds of divorce. The doubtful meaning of Deuteronomy 24.1. The language in Deuteronomy 24.1 has always been in dispute. The Hebrew words erath, davha, if I pronounce that rightly, erath, davha, on which a correct interpretation depends, are not easy of solution. Though many exegetes, influenced possibly by some preconceived notion, pass on, pass over them quite flippantly. The phrase troubled the Jewish rabbis of older times as it does Jewish and Christian commentators and translators in our day. King James Version renders the two words some uncleanness and in the margin matter of nakedness. The latter though, a lateral translation of literal translation of the Hebrew word is quite unintelligible. Um, the Revised Version, British and American, and the American Standard Version both have some unseemly thing. Professor Driver translates the same words, some indecency, which makes it a little bit more clearer, doesn't it, indecency. The German, the Revised Version, British and American, Kotz has its widow watches, something repulsive. Again, we have a description of why um, divorce might be appropriate. But we know of no modern version which makes a raft of ha the equivalent of fornication or adultery. And indeed, in the very nature of the case, we are forced to make the words apply to a minor fault or crime. For by the Mosaic law, the penalty of adultery was death. Deuteronomy 22. It is, however, a question whether the extreme penalty was ever enforced. It is well known that at and some time before the time of the Saviour, there were two schools among the Jewish rabbis, that of the Shammai and that of the Hel. Shammai and his followers obtained that Erath Deha signifies nothing less than unchastity or adultery and argued that only this crime justified a man in divorcing his wife. Hillel and his disciples went to the other extreme. They placed great stress upon the words, if she finds no favour in his eyes, immediately preceding Arach Debar, and contended that divorce should be granted for the flimsiest reason, such as the spoiling of a dish either by burning or caressing or careless seasoning. Some of the rabbis boldly taught that a man had a perfect right to dismiss his wife if he found another woman whom he liked better. This is what was going on in Mark. Or who was more beautiful. Here are some other specifications taken from the same book. The following women may be divorced. She who violates the law of Moses, causes her husband to eat food which has not been timed. Um, she who vows but does not keep her vows. She who goes out on the street with her hair loose or spins in the street or converses, flirts with any man or is a noisy woman. What is a noisy woman? It is one who speaks in her own house so loud that the neighbours may hear her. It would be easy to extend the list for the Mishnah and the rabbinic writings are full of such laws. So you can see what um, stresses they are under. From what has been said, it is clear that adultery was not the only valid reason for divorce. Besides, the word adultery had a particular significance in Jewish law, which recognized polygamy and concubinage as legitimate. Thus, a Hebrew might have two or more wives or concubines and might have intercourse with a slave or a bondwoman, even if married, without being guilty of the crime of adultery. For adultery, according to the Jewish law, was possible only when a man dishonoured the free wife of a Hebrew. We're nearly there. Divorcement, Billah. 
The expression found in Deuteronomy, Isaiah and Jeremiah, as listed, is a translation of the Hebrew word sefer kerith, kerith uth. Sefer kerith uth, if I pronounce that connect correctly. The two words literally rendered signify a document or book of cutting off, a certificate of divorce given by a husband to a wife so as to afford her the opportunity or privilege of marrying another man. The Hebrew term is rendered by the Septuagint, Biblion, apostason, 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 marison, apostason. This is also found in the New Testament, Mark 10.4, which we're dealing with at the moment, and Matthew 5.31, as the writing of divorcement. In English versions of the Bible, but Matthew 19.7, the King James Version, has writing, while the Revised Version, British and American, and the American Standard Version, have built. The certificate of divorce is called get, plural get, in the Talmud. There is an entire chapter devoted to the subjects in the Mishnah. It is not positively known when the custom of writing bills of divorcement commenced, but there are references to such documents in the earliest Hebrew legislation. The fact that Joseph had in mind putting away of his spouse wife Mary without the formality of a bill or at least a public procedure provides that a decree was not regarded as absolutely necessary. And the following was the unusual form of the decree. On the month of etc., and you might want to stop the video and read that for yourself. Spiritual application. The Hebrew prophets regarded Yahweh not only as the father and king of the chosen people, and thus entitled to perfect obedience and loyalty on their part, but they conceived of him as a husband married to Israel, Isaiah speaking to his nation says, For thy maker is thy husband, Yahweh of hosts is his name, Jeremiah 2 makes use of similar language in the following. Return, O backsliding children, saith Yahweh, for I am a husband unto you. It is perfectly natural that New Testament writers should have regarded Christ's relation to his church under the same figure. Paul in 2 Corinthians says, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy for I spoused you to one husband, that I might present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And you can read these other passages. Any unfaithfulness or sin on the part of Israel is regarded as spiritual adultery, which, necessar which necessarily broke off the spiritual ties and divorced the nation from God. So that was a pretty extensive read. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus said. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So we weren't to have interferers in the um, core of a marriage. But too, too often these days, people are interfering in everybody's marriage, particularly churches and cults. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And the context here is without a legitimate reason, right? It's without a positive, fair and just legitimate reason. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. But the woman couldn't take the incentive on divorcing the husband. The divorce had to come from the husband to the woman. So um, this would have been a very difficult woman who could convince the husband to divorce her if he didn't want to. If he knew that she knew the husband was going to stay and not give in, then she'd make it very difficult for him to the point where he would give in and then marries another man, she commits adultery. So these are instances of divorce that aren't fair, right, or, or just. They're illegitimate uses of the um, divorce way in which it should have been used. They're corrupted uses of divorce. They're not fair and just. Now Jesus says, the little children and Jesus. 
People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. Poor old disciples. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Now that's a very strong statement, isn't it? But if we go back to where we talk about, talked about little children before, it was all about simply believing in the Messiah. So it's about believing in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them and blessed them. And as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, right? Good teacher. He still hasn't got the Messiah. Nobody's saying the Messiah. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is one of my big things, isn't it? What we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Well, this guy's come up to the Lord and said, hey, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. Now this will be interesting, won't it? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. Now you either think I'm God, or you don't. Right? So immediately Jesus addresses the issue. You either think I'm the Messiah, or you don't. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You should not defraud, honour your father and your mother, teacher, he declared, and this is a lie. All these I have done and kept since I was a boy. That's a lie. Nobody can keep those laws because the problem's in our heart. And not only that, you have to keep the whole law, not just the ones that Jesus mentioned in brief there. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Jesus didn't need to say that, but he challenged the man from a totally different direction to where the context was in showing him what he needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Jesus moved it away from the idea that you have to keep the law, which is what people will tell you today, oh, I have to do this or I have to do that, and said it's not about what you have to do or not do, it's about what you have or don't have and where it's going, what you do have, where it's going. Um, but you can't buy your way into heaven either. So this is a bit, you know, I think Jesus was just throwing the man out, trying to change his thinking about what was going to be something that would give him internal life. Now, all of this didn't matter. It was this part. Then come follow me or come and believe in me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Well, whether he had great wealth or not is not the problem when because he didn't follow Christ anyway. You can have great wealth and follow Christ. This man couldn't find his way through that. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. You know why they were amazed at his words? Because they had a money pot as well. They, all, they were fishermen. They were industrial men. But Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's not that hard. All you have to do is believe. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if your richness is binding you to believing, then true. But if it's not, then not. Because it's not about your wealth. It's about your belief. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Because they had a lot of money themselves, <laughs> believe it or not. They were pretty well off, these disciples. And not only that, Judas had the money bag, which had a fair amount of money in it as well. 
Jesus looked at them and said, with this, is it, with man this is impossible, but with God all possible things, all things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. <laughs> He's taken it personal. And this is a lot of times when you're trying to resolve things with people, excuse me, you won't be pointing the finger at them, you'll just be trying to resolve something, but they'll take it personal. Truly I say to you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions for your trouble and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And I believe that comments there because the poor old Jews were stuck under the law and they were blinded, but the Gentiles just waltzing because Jesus makes a lot more sense more easily to the Gentiles than he does to the Jews because it was more personal for the Jews, as it were. They're on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise from the dead. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> so do I. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in glory. Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. They had no concept at all of what was going to happen to Christ. Jesus answered them, You will drink the cup and I, the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be first a slave. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples. Together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked and told him to be quiet, which is not uncommon when somebody's trying to reach out to Christ. But as he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me, Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet, he is calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. And Jesus said, Go. Your faith has made you well. Go, you faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Well, sorry if that went for a little bit longer than normal, but my goodness me. Um, again, we're seeing Jesus um, try and get across the message that he is the Messiah. We learned a little bit about divorce. Uh, this is Dr. Jason. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, 
maybe even comment if you're watching on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.